Well, welcome again. It's great to see all of you in God's house. And uh, thank you, Deb and Tamara, all of our music folks, and everyone making worship possible this morning. We continue our series in the Gospel of Luke in the footsteps of Jesus. And this morning we're looking at the story of the lost coin. We're in Luke chapter 15, verses 8 through 10. It is a short parable, but has lots of meaning in it. And Jesus said, suppose a woman has 10 silver coins and loses one. Doesn't she light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, rejoice with me. I've found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there is much rejoicing in the presence of the angel of God over one sinner who repents. Wow. Well. This morning we're looking lost in the house. Anyone besides myself have lost something and were terribly frustrated by that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, have you lost something in your house? <laughs> Is that more frustrating than anything? Uh, am I right? For Savannah and I, it's either the cell phone or the TV remote. And... <laughs> <laughs> things that we use all the time that you don't really think about when you lay it down. And uh, I can recall that we've <laughs> looked all over for uh, the cell phone. In fact, there's been times when we, you know, for both of us have cell phones now, drove back to the church, looking all over for the church for the cell phone. N now, only to find it, you know, in, on the couch, underneath, way underneath, down below, and, uh, and now they have the locator on it. Thank God for that little locator, right? So you can locate it. But then it just says it's in the house. So you know you're close. And you hope the battery doesn't run out before you find the cell phone. Now, for our TV remote, at least, it doesn't have that. And, and we lose that remote all the time. We're supposed to only put it in one or two spots. But for some reason or other, it, gets, it slides down on the couch. We have looked all over for that. Now, I know you, many of you in my generation at least know this, but the younger generation doesn't know. You know the TV does work without the remote. <laughs> I tell my daughter, you know, that thing will work without that remote, but it is better with the remote, right? And, uh, and so it's so frustrating to lose something in our house. Well, this morning we look at being lost in the house. Now, this parable is a, is a very interesting parable on a number of levels. It is sandwiched in between two much more famous parables, right? The parable of the lost sheep that we looked at last week, the shepherd goes after the lost sheep. And then after this, following this parable, is the most famous story that Jesus ever told, the parable of the lost son, which we'll look at next week. And it's short, and I think the parable of the lost coin sometimes is shortchanged. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it was good, though. All right. But there's this story, though short, is really rich in meaning. And it's on a number of different levels. In the first place is that God in this moment is pictured as a, as a woman looking for her lost coins. And this is one of the feminine images of God in God's Word. And so it's an important added kind of layer to that. And, uh, and there's something else here, which is that unlike the parable of the lost sheep and the parable of the lost son, this parable, what gets lost, which is the coin, gets lost in the house. It gets lost in the house. How many know that you can get lost in God's house? The church can get lost in God's house. And you, you and I, as individuals, can get lost in God's house as well. And so I invite you into this story this morning that is so, so important. Now, remember, Jesus is talking to religious leaders who are upset that he is fellowshipping with sinners, tax collectors, the worst sinners of all, but also the least, the lonely, the last, the marginalized, those on the outside, and they are offended. And Jesus tells these three stories in succession that all have meaning and together have an important meaning, which we'll look at next week as well. But in this moment, it's really a beautiful story of um, this woman 
It's usually pictured as an older woman, which I get, right? It doesn't really matter, but an older woman, and she has 10 silver coins, and she lost one coin. And this woman is frugal, <laughs> like me and you probably, right? And, uh, and she's looking for this lost coin. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because implied here, what are the reasons for the lost coin? It doesn't say, but because of her actions, we kind of know what the reasons are. Well, either the reason is that the house is dark or the house is dirty. The house is either dark or the house is dirty because she cleans and she sweeps, right? Well, so I think in our own lives, are there moments even in God's house where we feel dark or we feel dirty? Hopefully God's house isn't dark or dirty. What places in your life this morning are dark? You know what I'm talking about. Things you feel guilty for in the past, failures, sins, shortcomings, whatever that is. And you bring those into God's house with you. And the same thing with kind of that dirty feeling. You know, am I okay in God's house? Maybe I need to hide in the corner in God's house. Or I'm distracted in God's house. And I'm not about the light and the right in God's house. And know this, that wherever you are in God's house this morning, that if you're lost, that God comes looking for you. Then that's, that's the good news. Because I'm here to tell you that lots of times people get lost in God's house because they're distracted about why we really need to be in church, to let God's light shine in our lives, to show love to other people, including the lost, the lonely, the least, the marginalized, those on the outside, that we are to be about being a family of God where the love of Christ is the center of of all that we do, and the light of Christ is what lights this house different than every other place on the planet. God's house. And then notice what happens. This little old lady, maybe she's a younger woman, I don't know, but it's always pictured that way. I kind of like God as a little old lady, right? Is wise. And what does she do? I want you to notice that in this very short parable, it has more action words than almost any other, certainly of any other of this length. So what does God do? Well, God looks, God searches, God sweeps, God lights a lamp, and when God finally finds the lost coin, or this woman who's represented as God, she rejoices. Looks, searches, finds, sweeps, lights a lamp, searches all over until she finally finds the lost coin and she rejoices. And in that moment, we realize that, that God is about finding you when you're lost in your darkness and in your dirtiness, in your feelings of guilt and inadequacy, and your wrong motives for being in God's house sometimes, yes. But God is about finding you as the lost coin, because you're worth as much as all the rest. I think that's so powerful. And it's powerful on at least two levels, okay? The first is, if you're lost in God's house, God wants to find you. God wants to take away the darkness and bring light. God wants to take the dirtiness away and sweep it clean. And God is willing to search every corner until God finds you and lights the darkest night sweeps you clean and embraces you and rejoices others. And the second thing is, that is so clear in the context of all this, is that the church needs to have that as the number one priority. And unless it does, it is not about the mission and ministry that Jesus Christ would have us. Because Jesus spoke this very poignantly at the religious leaders who scoffed at Jesus being with the sinners, the outcasts, the lost, the least, the marginalized, those who need a healing touch. And Jesus was telling that in that context to both those who were hurting and lonely, dark, needed cleanliness, and those religious leaders. And we need to have our priorities the same as Jesus Christ, for we are the house of God. 
Now, I, I love this writing from Paul, who says this, that Deb read earlier. Because he wants us to know that if you're in God's house, and you're feeling dark and lonely, that it's the love of God that lights up everything. And this is what Paul says. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge, so you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That God's love, God's breadth and depth, like the deepest ocean and greater, like the greatest space and further, God's love is greater than all of that. For, after all, our Creator made all those things. The vastness of the universe, the beauty and wonder, the depth and breadth of the ocean. It reminds me also of Psalm 139. Do you recall it? I love this. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You discern my thoughts from afar and are acquainted with all my ways. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me, and your right hand shall hold me. Still you are there loving me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, and the light about me be night, still you are loving me. Even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as day, for darkness is as light with you. Isn't that beautiful? Maybe Jesus was thinking about that when he told that story of the woman in the lost coin, that she would light the candle, would look at all the crevices, that she would sweep the entire house again and again and again until she found the lost coin. And then she would rejoice. The lost coin was found. Fred Craddock tells a wonderful story. He's a famous preacher, scholar, and he tells a story of the time when he was in North Georgia, a very small rural country church. And their tradition was that for the Easter sunrise service, they gather by this river, from a big creek, he said. And elders would get there ahead of time and make a fire. And everybody would gather in a circle. And then everyone who had had a moment where they were come to be found by the love of Christ, saved by God's grace and love, that year would come forward one by one. And they'd tell the story of faith, and they'd go down and they'd baptize them in the river on Easter morning. So it was cold sometimes. So then they'd all have the people who were just baptized, they came to know the Lord in this inner ring around the fire, put warm towels and blankets on them, and then have them go around and say a little bit more. And then in the outer circle was all the other people in the church. And one by one, those people would go and they'd introduce themselves. And even more than introduce themselves, they'd say, well, I'm, I'm Bill and um, I have a garage. And if you ever need your vehicle fixed, come and I'll be happy to help you out. So now it's Pete would say, well, Listen, I'm retired, but I like to chop wood. And if you need any wood chopped, then I'll take care of that. Someone else would say they could help with the house. And they just go around and someone else might just say, well, they, they love them. When they're all done in that circle, they'd all join hands in prayer. And then he said, Percy, <laughs> this older guy named Percy who had put out the fire and say, well, folks, it's time to, it's time to go home. Then Percy would walk over to Fred Craddock and say, well, you know what? It just doesn't get any better than this, does it? And Fred Craddock would say, yes. Well, one time Fred Craddock was telling that story. He was doing a scholarship series, a lecture series in Chicago. <laughs> at a, you know, Upper Crust University up there. And um, at the end of the Q&A, and man sort of, you know, prim and proper says, well, you know, that circle thing, what do you call that circle thing <laughs> that you talked about? <laughs> and Fred Craddock, in his inimitable way, said, I don't know what you folks call that in North Chicago, but in North Georgia, we call that church. <laughs> That's right. The way it should be. 
That's the way it should be. You might not do that physically, but that's really what it ought to be about. Coming together as a circle, support those that are lost, lonely, least marginalized in our life. Where are you today? Do you feel like that lost coin in God's house sometimes that even a place that is all about the love of Christ, sometimes we get distracted and we can come in and feel dark and dirty. But God is like this woman that's lighting a candle and sweeping and searching until God finds us and God wants to light up the darkest night with the love of Christ and to sweep us clean and to make us new and to rejoice. And we as the church, as the family of faith, need to be about the very same things, to reflect God's love, to put first the lost, the lonely, the least, the marginalized, to be about the love of Christ, to be about inviting God's presence in so that the light shines brightest in the darkness as we show our love and grace to others and to rejoice when one who is dirty and off to the side is cleansed by the power and forgiveness and grace of Almighty God. I'll close with this true story that I love. The story is told of this uh, college that had a campus ministry. <clears throat> big college, big university. It wasn't a Christian university, but they had a campus ministry. And this young college student by the name of Bill had never, never been in a church before. Grew up with parents, not the best family. And, uh, and he felt kind of broken and alone, bad priorities. And he found his way to a Friday evening campus ministry thing. And uh, well, they shared the love of faith. It came for a while and um, was searching. And the folks there at the campus ministry said, you know what you need to be about is to, in addition to this campus ministry, is to find a church to be a part of. There's lots of them around here. Okay, because I've never been to a church. And so finally, after a number of weeks, he decided he was going to be bold enough to go into church because he'd never been in a church before. And that took some courage from him. There was a big campus, big campus church, you know, one of those big formal churches across the way from the college. And so he decided he was going to go to that because he just walked to it. And so he didn't want to go early. That was just too intimidating. <laughs> he went to kind of slip in quietly after church had started. And so he mustered the courage one Sunday to make his way into this church. And when he got in there, the church service was not only well underway, but the pastor was preaching, sung all the hymns, beginning, pastor was preaching, and every seat was, was full. And so this college student, he's used to campus ministry, and he showed up in this very formal church with a lot of people with three-piece suits, all looking their very, very best for Sunday morning. And he had jeans that were not only dirty, but they were tattered and torn, and uh, just an old dirty t-shirt. That's the way he went to the campus ministry, no problem. So he showed up to church that way. And when he opened the doors, there was a number of people that looked at him. <laughs> and the pastor was preaching. He just kept preaching. And, uh, and his student didn't know what to do. But he decided to do what he normally did at campus ministry, was just go up front and sit down. So he, he made his way down the aisle, and uh, everybody was, like, watching this uh, college student. And a uh, college student comes to the front and sits down. The pastor just kept preaching, no problem. But then this elderly deacon that was known for being very formal stood up in the back of the church. He had a three-piece suit on, you know, just impeccably dressed, immaculate. And he had this cane because he was an elderly gentleman. And he made his way slowly down the aisle. And everybody, as he passed pew by pew, was like taking a deep breath. What was this elderly deacon that's so formal going to do? And they all, even the pastor was kind of watching him as he goes. And he made his way down front to where the college student was sitting, you know, with his legs crossed, jeans and t-shirt down in front of the pulpit. And he came up next to the college student and very gingerly with his cane, he studied himself and then he sat down next to the college student. And the pastor stopped the sermon and said, you know what, the sermon I'm preaching this morning, you may remember for a week or two or a month, but the sermon you just saw I hope you remember for a lifetime. Well, that's so true. To make people feel at home in God's house, no matter what they're dressed like, 
for that elderly gentleman to come down and to sit next to that college student. It's like the love of God. Willing to put ourselves where they are, to put aside whatever form and formality we might be used to, and to be about sharing God's love for at least the lonely, lost, forgotten, for the dark, for the dirty, whatever that is, just like Jesus was saying in this story this morning. So friends, good news. All of us sometimes feel dark and dirty, even in God's house. But God is here. You can always find God in God's house looking for you, loving you. So much so that God is willing to search and to sweep, to light a lamp, look high and low, near and far, until God finds you and rejoices. And we, we as the family of faith, need to do the very same thing. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you that you are in your house looking for us with a heart of longing and grace and love and tenderness searching. And you, you wash us clean. You lift us up. You light a candle of love in Christ Jesus our Lord and make all things new. Help us all to be about that. We pray in Christ's name and all God's people said, amen. amen.